just to give some context in relation to um, my paper today, um, I did my PhD research on London and basing uh, quite a while ago. And there was kind of a nomological aspect to the research, particularly interested um, in the idea of cultural speed, um, key feature of the drum bass music, and jump drum bass, is its speed. Um, and also ideas relating to speed concerning cultural value. Um, and you know, in a broader context, I'm, I'm quite interested in the way in which we think about music cultures from sort of, a, I guess, a, a, the position of cultural stratification what we consider to be good, bad, you know, ideas around some sort of cultural taste, essentially. And, um, and it's interesting how authenticity with the context of music-based taste cultures has kind of hung on. We've sort of gone through sort of the kind of post-modern period whereby, you know, it's considered to be that you know, Mozart was, was, is as valuable as Madonna from a cultural perspective. But, you know, regardless, you know, still ideas about authenticity and, 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 and the notions of Bad, um, uh, persist, they continue, and particularly in dance music. So, despite the kind of democratization of technology um, that dance music benefits from, um, you know, technology really enabling access to some music production process, notions of what's right and what's wrong in relation to the creative process sort of persist. And authenticity is kind of you know, the, the, the core aspect around which those ideas uh, pivot. So, to a large extent, this paper really is about the way in which authenticated narratives still persist in an electronic dance music form, like on bass. And it happens in a particular way. Um, it often centers on the kind of rhythms um, associated with drum bass, especially the break beats. We'll talk a little bit about break beats as we go through the session. Um, just to kind of preamble, um, I'm going to use the terms jungle and drum and bass interchangeably. I know there is some politics around you know, some correctness of using the term jungle in the context of drum and bass. That's another paper or another panel. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. So when I use the terms of jungle and drum and bass, I'm broadly meaning the same thing. Um, so just to summarize the kind of key themes, I guess, of the paper. Um, speed is, is associated, the speed of the music is, is often defined in both within and without, largely without drum bass, as a, a kind of a, a low form of experience. It's often defined in terms of its stupidity, which is really interesting. Even from within the drum bass, the idea that fast music is inherently stupid. And the term stupid sort of turns up a lot discussing you know, drum bass from within that scene, but also fan cultures and um, audiences, musical audiences generally, they, they, they interpret drum bass is lowness, I guess, to its kind of, this formal characteristic of its speed. But within the scene, you'll often find, interesting a different um, characterization of that experience. And that relates really to the kind of rhythmic characteristic of break beats. Um, so on the one hand, you have the kind of rhythmic aspect of uh, speed, which concerns the tempo and time, uh, seeing, broadly speaking, externally outside the scene as somehow defined properly as sort of stupid, but within uh, the politics of rhythm take on a slightly different position. And that is sort of a, the breakbeat is an articulation of a kind of scientific exploration. You take a breakbeat, you pull it apart, you sample it, you sort of break it down into its constituent parts, you create new elements, new breakbeats, and it's part of a creative process or quasi-scientific process. So you have these two competing narratives in relation to the politics of rhythm drum bass. And that authenticated narrative from within the scene, the idea of drum bass as a kind of breakbeat science, is often linked to its kind of roots, the roots of the rhythms in funk tracks from the 1960s and 70s. So there is a kind of an interconnectedness, and some of my research connected what Anne has been doing, Anne Danielson, in relation to funk and also Mark Butler. Um, and the way in which sort of within those funks, funk and soul, um, funk is an articulation of a kind of, sort of political impulse. Um, it's not just something that you feel or uh, uh, you know, an aspect that you know, makes you dance. It has political and cultural meaning. And then, um, looking at the way that rhythm is discussed within drum and bass culture, it's often um, rhythm as a sort of creative framework is often um, a jumping point into the development of new genres and new styles. And this often involves a kind of, again, an authentic narrative, authenticated narrative of going backwards. How can we 
find again this lost realness, this lost authenticity. You know, we've become, we've taken one creative direction, it's gone one place. We've lost what, you know, the roots of the music, its funkiness. So just to give some broader historical context, Jungle or Jungle Techno developed from 1992 as the soundtrack to London's inner city rave scene. And it's based on a combination of powerful bass riffs and break beats or breaks uh, to focus on today's uh, paper, I guess. And these are like a synthesized or sample from existing sources, song and funk records, or involve a combination of both. Break beats are loops within drum bass, jump drum bass tracks are uh, repeated. Uh, and accelerated to around 170 beats per minute, so significantly faster than the source material, the tracks from which they came. And here is just a selection of breaks from salt tracks, you get some more time, uh, some of the tracks, you get some more time, I'm just a list of uh, the tracks themselves, which is just a collection of breaks, to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. And those are actually sped up to about 130 beats per minute, so they're, they're significantly faster than, again, the, the, sort of the original recordings. But in drum bass, they're sped up even further to around 170 and beyond. Just play some examples to give a sense of the context within which break beats appear on some early drum bass tracks. Don't play the whole thing, just sort of uh, some excerpts, I guess. <laughs> seems to be the kind of jumping off point into the idea of a sort of narrative of creativity within the jungle and drum and bass. We'll talk about that in a little, little bit, so the last example. Um, yeah. And broadly speaking, some jungles mainstream popularity peaked in the 1990s, it arguably becomes the sort of unofficial uh, electronic dance music soundtrack for the era of the Court Britannia, sort of mid 1990s moment, the great second period of the 1990s, and sort of you know, it gave rise to, I guess, media celebrities like Goldie, who's featured there, um, receiving his, his MBE, so I guess he's really establishment now, right? Um, and he was one of the key figures, so uh, probably started to represent a group, won the Mercury Music Prize in 1997. Um, so, you know, those moments are, are seen as sort of the, the kind of high points of the sort of mainstream sentence of jungle and bass. And to broadly summarise it from a kind of political and cultural perspective, its formation can be thought about as a sort of post-colonial response to the problematic effects of globalisation and post-industrialisation, and especially the growth of an accelerated culture, and I guess my PhD research was interested in the kind of interconnections between the development of the music and um, this very suburban metropolitan context, and the sense that the world is somehow speeding up. How do you manage if you're sort of, you know, landed, if you're, you know, very much ensconced, immersed in the urban inner city, your social aspirations are relatively limited, yet the world is kind of somehow speeding up. How do you make sense of it? I guess you make really fast music that sort of repeats a lot, gives you a sense of security, but at the same time, it gives you a sense of managing this kind of external uh, environment. It's still very much present in some aspects in the mainstream, it's a big part of the global uh, EDM culture. Uh, it's in the 2010s, uh, Sun and Bass Festival, the biggest sort of festivals in Sardinia, the full sit drum bass festival in Sardinia, which actually taking place this week. Um, and it sort of still persists in the kind of uh, the, the pop charts and sort of the radio driven form, you know, artists like Sigma, DJ Fresh, Mental, etc. So it's kind of still around uh, in the mainstream, it still kind of exists. And just sort of characterise the breakbeat um, in, in a bit more detail, it's very much distinguished from what 
Green Belt drives relentless four quarter beats of most other mainstream electronic dance music forms like house uh, and techno. And breakbeats are uh, used to jump around the bass. They're brief, syncopated rhythms. It's slightly wonky. It's my technical term. Um, you know, and uh, they are sort of, sort of drawn from the source material soul and funk tracks from the 1960s and 70s. Uh, the sampling of, and the looping of breakbeats becomes a technique that's popularized by hip hop. Uh, in the 1980s, and that's a big sort of informing framework for uh, jungle and drum and bass artists in the 1990s. And um, in jungle and drum and bass, there is a preference for this repeating quality of breakbeats. Um, and Schloss describes, um, I guess, sort of the cultural framework of the breakbeats uh, as you know, belonging to an African American compositional aesthetic that foregrounds cyclic motion. Repetition and variation and groove. Okay, so groove, I guess, is very close to the idea of funk. But funk is also a kind of African American slang term for bad smell or sweatiness or bodily excess. So it has a kind of low cultural series of connotations. So let's say we kind of, on the one hand, we have the sense of its key characteristics, the breakbeat, as of you know, having belonged to this African American. Um, tradition, it's a long historical tradition, but at the same time, culturally speaking, it carries these negative uh, connotations. And it's interesting in, in this context, that even within dance culture, um, certainly in the early, the early formation of jungle and drum and bass, it was initially dismissed um, by, the main, by the mainstream dance media, um, largely ignored by publications like Mix Man, um, took a lot of time for jungle and drum and bass to appear in those contexts. It really wasn't the mainstream radio until about 1995. Um, you know, it would already been around for, for a good two or three years. Late 94, I guess. But it's been it was supported by an underground subculture of legal, legal and illegal raves, pirate radio stations, specialist record shops. And Coach Rich, an early uh, article on, on Jungle Drum, Jungle Drum, I guess, at the time, he says, it is, it Jungle is the one music everyone agrees is no good. While the very fact that questions of race and class come up over and over uh, indicates unease with the music's following, but who, are, who they are and what they're up to. So he's really identifying uh, race and class uh, as the key sort of points of, I guess, negativity or pessimism in relation to the sort of reception, the cultural reception of jungle drum bass. Based on its strongly black British and working class origins and its foregrounding, the digitally programmed sample and accelerated funky breaks. So on the one hand, it's marginal, culturally, ethnically, in the context of class, but it's also very synthesized. It's really it's based on digital technology. So there are different kinds of uh, negative discourse, critical discourse is happening there. And Goodwin argues a long time ago now that Western audiences prefer to see their pop musicians doing something in view of a scrutinizing gaze that serves to authenticate musical competence and the idea of Sampling and then sort of, you know, that kind of a very immersed digital production doesn't really belong to that narrative. You know, it's a studio based music, and even worse, I guess it's based on other people's records. You know, taking these elements, repeating them, cutting them up, you know, is it's still within sort of pop and culture discourse as a kind of seems a kind of synthetic or something. So, practice like sampling and time stretching, making the rhythms go faster, contributes to the view of drum bass is a product of a, an impulse, a creative uh, impulse that emphasizes fast, the fast and cheap production of standardized music. Um, and certainly the early days of drum and drum bass, uh, early radio music, it was really made on technology that's computers that were largely associated with video games, the Commodore Amiga, the Atari ST. Um, and uh, you know, that, 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 that was another aspect that gave you know, this is sort of fast and cheap, given you know, that this millennium of being sort of fast and cheap music, you now it's made by opportunists, hustlers who are kind of interested in selling a few records, making £500 or £1,000, but not really interested in being professional musicians. You know, they're kind of just people who sort of hustle with this. Um, so this, you know, sit outside the, the normalised idea of you know, musical competence, playing or instruments, playing in real time. And the uh, breakbeats that, that constitute articulations of, you know, kind of a sense of the spell aspect of them, some sort of working class theme. Sociologists have talked about uh, the present time orientation of the working classes or the people within 
didn't work in class. There is a kind of, you know, live fast, die young uh, sort of impulse that you don't quite know what the future holds. So, you know, you're into risky activity, you know, sort of fast culture, and the music seems to align with that. And also, it's the kind of stupid music for stupid people, uh, which was uh, Martin James is a journalist, sort of reading of uh, the way the drum and bass is received. So, you know, some text sites and all that, I've collected some friendly comments from various blogs and, 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 and forums I've given over the, uh, over the years. And I'll just go through very quickly. Uh, as I previously mentioned, plenty of my friends listen to drum and bass. And while I have no many medical credentials or scientific proof to back up the following point, I do believe from my own experiences that it's still true. Drum and bass makes people stupid. When most of my friends started listening to it, I saw a rapid decline in their intelligence. <laughs> they began finding art to concentrate on the simplest of tasks. This went on to the point, uh, uh, this went on to the point where some of them could no longer tie their shoes or even spell their own names. Second, then, per usual, a DMV song came across on Spotify, destroying my concentration, making me so angry I moved my wife on bass garbage and came across this beautiful blog, this is the drum and bass hate blog. Uh, I've had a lot of money deep down there fighting the fight against this so called music. Let's try to keep the BPM of music below 170 for the sake of future generations. Good luck out there, brothers and sisters. So, making sort of the direct allusions to the music speed, you know, the speed of the music, you know, makes you stupid, is, is the discourse. Uh, it's just really repetitive, and the rest of the class here is repetitive BS noise. It's Chad fuel. You know, it's very nice to the working classes. Uh, they would only hate it when they sit around in their cars playing banging tunes, aka DMB. All I can usually hear is some shouting his balls off uh, with a load of, of messy drums. This MC in the drums, as all the references to there, which is almost always the same for all songs in the background. The same thing loops on and on. I hate it so much. There. So again, to reference is there, this is the sense in which drum bass, at least from a you know, to External audiences, well, this is the right term, is often seen as yeah, fast, cheap, fast living, fast money music associated with working class, uh, you know, metropolitan, uh, you know, sort of inner city uh, communities, really had no uh, kind of cultural value. And it's based on the rhythmic aspects of the music, but in contrast, within the culture, there is this sense of, 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 of its constructed, the constructiveness of the break, break beats as being as a kind, a kind of art form. Now there is this narrative of science, great right? science within the genre. And this sort of allows uh, an authenticating discourse to emerge around its production. So you, you, know, you see and hear the term breaking science or breaking science appear uh, quite a lot. And this kind of authenticating discourse is linked to knowledge of the source material. Where did those breaks come from? You know, how those, you know, where, what, what, what's the sort of origin of those breaks? You know, which year did the kind of, you know, the, the original funk track come out that the break has, has been used? So it's not just a kind of, there's not only a sort of sense of a present time orientation in terms of the affect of the music, but also a kind of sense of, yes, we can look to the parts, the music, the song, the source material is actually kind of archive. Every track is kind of an archive of the rhythm and funk, and we can connect on the basis of the previous style of genre. And this discourse permeates the genre and form of its you know, education within the, the scene as a kind of breakbeat culture. It's sometimes called a bass culture, but we're talking about breakbeats and breakbeat culture is widely used. And it's as indicates in the name of the, name of the long running London uh, dance event, Breaking Science. <coughs> and this, is skim through these last few slides, and this uh, highlights this, the sense in which breakbeats and, you know, breakbeat, the use of breakbeats and engaging with articulates a kind of um, uh, obsessiveness, uh, focus on the music complexity, taking you know, rhythms, deconstructing them, you know, breaking them down, source material, and then sort of producing new rhythms and new breaks. And you know, linked to this sort of narrative of science is the notion of intelligent drum and bass, which is a view that Tony used quite a lot in the 1990s. Um, and also the way in which, within that scene, uh, there is an authentication based on you know, its roots, uh, uh, you know, the connectedness to some an African diasporic historical cultural background, or just the knowledge of that musical culture, of those musical cultures. And so, all sorts of the complexity uh, within uh, breakbeats, and he's talking um, not just about front bass, about hip hop too. A breakbeat is simply a rhythm uh, which is not in the form of the four marbles. Breakbeats are often more rhythmically complex, and there are opportunities to create unique, exciting, and individual patterns. And this ability to create new patterns is reinforces this discursive, you know, uh, 
notion of brain and science. And this is in contrast to the sort of mainstream neural base, which is seen as quite simplistic from within that, um, uh, that, that scene, that culture. And the term two-step is really is often used to describe what a mainstream commercially oriented uh, drum base. And also as well as the sort of use of the pop motifs, such as the visual song structure, a lot of instrumentation. Um, and this is the track from the first drum base number one. Yeah, from my, from uh, 2014, uh, right now, you know it. And this, you know, from within the drum bass scene, there is a sense in which you know, this is, yes, it's formally speaking, it's drum and bass. Um, fine, oh, yeah, the time is like, but I wasn't speed up yet. I'm sorry for taking my way. And just to give you a, a finish up, really, um, a lot of contemporary artists. Um, particularly a, a guy from Paradox, but within this kind of the genre of drum funk and this, this emphasis on funky drum bass, called drum funk, you know, he picks up the mic and the pathway through his performance, kind of plays live, I guess. And Luke the Break means saying, well, this is the track that it came from, this is its, uh, its context, this is the original recording. Well, I'll kind of summarize the things in the there. Just to summarise, all the sample breakings and drum bass shows how authenticity and strongly correlate with cultural capital in, in digital music cultures, for art, traditional forms of identity, such as race and class. So, knowledge of the source material is um, uh, you know, enough to gain cultural capital in that scene. Digital studio techniques associated with speed and musical uh, competence, sampling and looping, can quickly form sophisticated creative directions. Ideas about cultural value, like intelligence and stupidity, or the mainstream and underground, can be attached to relatively abstract sonic or musical units such as rhythm, and there is an impulse, this looking backwards, to resurrect a lost authenticity, which is, we have the last of my talks really talking about uh, developing new genres and subgenres within uh, drum and bass, but this impulse to create new genres is often seen as a kind of, you know, is often based on this desire to look back, to look back. Previous stuff, so it's been lost in the process. So, yeah, sorry for the time. Only questions, I guess. Yeah. We'll see if we have enough voice because I don't think we need a microphone. Yes. Oh, yeah, thanks very much. Really interesting. Um, I'm interested in, like, um, you speak about almost like the legitimization of the intelligence side of things. I was wondering if you explored a lot of that, because I don't know too much, but. So I used to be sold when I was a kid, LJ Booker was a jazz pianist. In a way, it's sort of like because they were also uh, kids of some sort of like legitimate tradition, therefore we should take things more seriously. And then that idea of playing against like the, the oh, you just said two step thing. Yes, it's more than that, I guess. It's, I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it? You have this kind of contrasting sort of narrative, you know, so it's this sort of style. I mean, something like Goldie went on Pirate Radio, a sort of London Pirate Radio session called Event, important radio station, and it's better than music, and saying also that jump was stupid. Done this stupid music, and we're into this thing, drum bass. Drum bass is different. And it's really interesting that that's what happens from within the scene. So that those competing narratives have kind of always been there. On the one hand, stupidity is fun. You know, sort of a banging tune is it, is fun. That speed aspect is fun. But at the same time, there is this sort of dialectical process that also produces this counter position. So that the jazz aesthetic, you know, it's a Cartesian mind body split to a large extent. Um, and you know, uh, I remember reading uh, the back of magazines and letters came from Ravens, sort of writing about his Dolce book, and this guy became a major star at drum bass. It was really boring, he's a really boring DJ. Why is it great for to use him? So that's interesting. So, this, there is a kind of, I guess, within drum bass, um, uh, a sense of um, vulnerability and a sense of sort of self 
that awareness in relation to why we're making this music that's, you know, kind of fast and that can be perceived as a bit dumb. How do we sort of counter that? And you might say jazz motifs, song, jazz, jazz stop tracks, and, 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 and you know, and break beats. So, you know, that's a really interesting, you know, that, that juxtaposition of all in there, really, from you know, the start of the um, music. University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.